thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be back on the Scripps campus today. And what I wanted to do uh, this afternoon was focus my lecture on the idea of uh, collecting in contemporary art. And about five or six years ago, I started researching what I found to be kind of a growing trend in the, in the contemporary art market. And there was a new group of American collectors specifically that were entering the, the market. And what they were doing was speculating on kind of relatively unknown artists at the time and pushing up the demand for certain artists' work. And what I was finding when I was doing the research was that there is a relatively very small group of people uh, be kind of behind this. And there were hedge fund managers and investment brokers. And so I want to kind of take that period of research, which I find a very pivotal point in collecting contemporary art, and just kind of examining that and looking back and you know, now being five years later, you know, the economy certainly has changed. Um, there's no longer some of these hedge funds and some of these uh, hedge fund managers have, have quickly kind of disappeared. But I feel that there's a, a, a lasting impact that their um, collecting habits really had on the contemporary art world. And so I kind of wanted to have that as a background kind of premise on sharing with you some of my experiences working in the contemporary field, um, working with different collectors in Los Angeles or in London, and specifically kind of bringing it back to being a gallery director for a gallery in, in Los Angeles and kind of dealing day to day with some of the decisions and repercussion that a, re, repercussions that a very small kind of group of people had on the, the art market. So I'll start um, by taking you through my first job in the art world, which is being an uh, intern. It was a three-month internship at the Broad Art Foundation. And this is, for those of you who haven't been there before, it's, a, it's an, actually an old telephone switching station located in Santa Monica. And it's right on Santa Monica, kind of on Ocean Avenue, right on the uh, border of Venice. And this is just a kind of a bad photo from Google Maps. So uh, this is the, the only photograph that I had of the outside of the building, actually. But it's a pretty special place. Um, on the outside, you, you know, there's no signs or anything that dis distinguishes that it's actually a, uh, housing this five-story collection of amazing uh, modern and contemporary art. And to give you a little bit of background about the foundation, um, it's owned by Eli and, and Edie Broad. And uh, for those of you, you probably are aware of, of who they are in the, the Los Angeles community. But to give you a little bit of background about the foundation itself, um, Eli was one of the founders of MOCA uh, in the early 1980s. And he quickly, and especially if you read anything about him in the papers lately, you can kind of see that he's uh, a very kind of quick temper. And he was, uh, while being a founder of MOCA, he was kind of quickly becoming uh, dissatisfied with the idea of a being on a board and he liked to be able to make kind of quick decisions and be able to make them on his own and so he had uh, the idea of starting an art foundation where he could collect uh, museum quality artwork and show them to the public and so one of the main premises of the foundation is to really be a lending library and this is particularly important in today's world where a lot of, um, you'll see a lot of artwork being bought at auction or by different people and you buy it and you never see it again. Um, and so his premise is really to, to share it with the world. And so this is just a, a quick shot of some of the current exhibitions and recent exhibitions of work that they've loaned to throughout the world. And the other premise of the, the foundation collection is to really collect work in depth. And so Cindy Sherman is a really great example of that. Um, there's always kind of stories of when I was doing research about Eli as a collector, um, he always kind of tells a story of, of collecting Cindy Sherman and having seen her work in her first show at Metro Pictures in the 80s. And so her work is really kind of special and unique to the collection because it's something that he collected very, very early on and now they've acquired, I don't know how many pieces are in the collection, hundreds of Cindy Sherman photographs that are really representative of every period and every body of work that she's produced. And so when I first started there, the whole first floor of the foundation was entirely devoted to Cindy Sherman. So we had uh, untitled film stills, which were always kind of one of my favorites, kind of a selection. And this is someone too, being an alumni of Scripps, someone that we looked at in some of my classes. So it was actually pretty fun for me to be working in an environment where you could kind of be working with the people that I recently studied. So you had the whole first floor kind of devoted to just different periods of work of Cindy Sherman. And you can kind of get a sense of you know, his collection and, and being in depth, um, which is a really 
you know, going back to the idea of being interested in collectors, um, it's really his, his work of being acquiring something in depth is really important because you don't see that a lot in, in today's contemporary world. Um, so while I was there, I was doing a lot of research. Um, I was giving museum uh, tours uh, to groups, school groups through the foundation, um, to museum board members and, and school groups, and doing a lot of research. It, it actually required, it was a little intimidating at first because uh, it's a big collection and there were a lot of important works on the wall, so I had to be pretty well versed in some of these artists. Um, so we had a big collection of Barbara Kruger at the time, uh, Robert Longo. I was uh, kind of interested at that point in studying a lot of the, the work that he'd collected kind of starting in the, in the 80s and 90s. So I was kind of getting very well versed in people like Cindy Sherman and Robert Longo, Barbara Kruger, Cheryl Levine. Um, they have a huge holding of Jeff Koons' work. So I was kind of interested in some of the works that they'd collected early on. And some of these pieces, if you've seen the, the Broad uh, collection of the new wing at LACMA, you might have seen these in person, too. This is the Jeff Koons, uh, Michael Jackson and Bubbles, the bunny. And they had acquired the balloon dog when I was there, too. So that was, I was kind of interested in, in how these acquisitions came to be as well. And so a lot of the things that I was researching at the time was helping Joanne Heiler, who's the curator and uh, director now of the foundation, um, she really kind of took me under her wing and I was doing a lot of research for her and looking at new acquisitions. They, they acquire about 25 to 100 works per year. And so what I was doing was really helping um, and learn about how you know, a collector of that scale considers buying a work, you know, kind of the work that's involved in it. If, if he's interested in buying a Gursky photograph, um, and we already have five in the collection. What are the things that he's looking at to kind of expand the collection, or if something's a, a good opportunity or not? Um, so we had Gursky up at the time, um, Ed Ruscha. So I was kind of doing a lot of market research and just kind of putting together uh, writing as well on a lot of these artists. And Andy Warhol is actually kind of an interesting person to look at in his collection as well. Um, he was actually just started acquiring his work not too long ago. It was when um, Andy Warhol had a retrospective at MOCA. This was about, I think, six or seven years ago. And uh, so it was kind of interesting that he had a few pieces, um, but he really started acquiring his work in depth after that show. And especially, in, you know, when I was working there, I was like, oh, that's a little, a little late, late to be on the, the Warhol um, take. But now looking, there's a, you know, auctions that were happening last week, and it's all in the papers that, Andy Warhol's now the new sensation. And I'm thinking, well, these people are really, really late to uh, collecting his work. So we had just a few examples of Andy Warhol in the collection. This is a Robert Therrien piece that was up in the collection. Um, if you haven't seen this work in person, it's a huge, uh, really huge scaled piece. And your, your head hits about the, the top of the leg of the chair. So this is a really fun piece to take people through. Um, little kids loved it. And it was just kind of a, a fun, fun installation. We had a big room of Christopher Wool paintings. And uh, we had just, when I first started there, we had just finished doing a big installation of the, the foundation. But it was kind of fun because I was kind of getting some inside stories on uh, some of the artists and their personalities, too. So at that point in time, it was really fun to try to get the gossip behind you know, what Christopher Wool was like in person installing this piece. And on the roof, there was a huge Tom Otterness exhibition. Um, it's a permanent installation. And this is just one example of one of the pieces up there. And one of the things that I was working on as well was creating a, kind of a, a walking um, exhibition catalog or, or little thing that you could kind of take through. Um, so I was doing a lot of research on Tom Otterness as well to have a kind of for educational purposes. And when I first started there, one of the projects that, um, because of my association with Joanne Heiler, she had known that I had written my uh, graduate thesis um, at Scripps on the artist Shereen Nishat. And funny enough, when I first started there, my first day, they were just installing two Shereen Nishat photographs right on either side of my desk. And it was this piece and this other photograph. And, uh, so she had me write a, um, it was at, at, the, at that point in time, the website was just beginning, which is kind of hard to believe at this, at this time. Um, but we were just starting to kind of put things on the website and write kind of longer texts that was, were describing certain works in the collection under kind of new acquisitions. And so 
one of the things that I first started on was writing about Sharina Shah because Joanne thought it would be kind of a good introduction for me to write about the, some, someone that I was familiar with. And this is another still of another film of Sharina Shah's that was installed on the other side of my desk. And um, I started having another appreciation for Sharina Shah. This is a piece of uh, where she, I think it's called Possessed, and she goes a little crazy. And so after about a year of having this uh, video loop, it was kind of gave me another appreciation of, of her work as an artist. And this is another piece uh, that I did some research on, Doug Aitken. Um, and actually, this is now installed at the foundation. So if you do get a chance to go, I, I hadn't seen this piece in, in person before, and I just saw it uh, about a year ago. So this is a piece called New Skin, where the woman in the video is uh, slowly losing her eyesight. And then this, if you have problems with nudity, I'll uh, close your eyes, I'll be brief on this. But another, um, another part of what I really enjoyed about the Foundation Collection was the opportunity to uh, go on courier trips. And I was really fortunate because the registrar at the time uh, wasn't so keen on traveling. She had a young family and I being really young and um, just, you know, I, I applied for every kind of thing, opportunity that I could and uh, I volunteered myself to go on courier trips and I, not thinking that they'd actually let me go on them and accompany these million dollar works and they did. And my first project was to take this Charles Ray male mannequin to the Tate Liverpool and it's just uh, pretty funny and this is where we installed it. And I mean, this piece has significant uh, memories for me because it's, um, it was right after 9-11 and they changed the way artwork could be shipped to Europe or different ways that um, larger pieces, uh, different airports could have access to them. And so I actually had to accompany the piece on a boat uh, under, <laughs> after flying to, I think we flew into Paris. Um, so, and I actually never got rid of it too. I, uh, I safely install, or installed it and then later when I was in London, um, they had asked me, the, the piece traveled then to Austria and they asked me since I was already in London if I could accompany the piece and do a condition report on the male mannequin again. And so um, it's kind of ironic that I, you know, was always, always there. And this is another piece of Charles Ray. And I was, at the time, I was thinking, well, why couldn't they, you know, the curator could have chosen this piece to be in the show, but. <laughs> yeah. And this is another um, courier trip that I did, which is a little bit easier on my half, at least, courier paintings. Um, and just to give you a little background, too, about being a courier, um, you know, your job is primarily just to kind of be the eyes of the foundation. A couple years before, we had a problem with um, no one had accompanied uh, the Jeff Koons, Michael Jackson, and Bubbles piece, and there was an incident. And so since then, um, any piece that was worth a considerable amount of money had to have a curator from the foundation of, uh, to accompany it. So the paintings ended up being a lot easier to do condition reports on and, and to travel with. And this, both of these pieces went to a museum in Berenz, Austria. This is kind of a bad sh slide, but this is one of my shots inside the museum. And so you're kind of working with the conservators and there's a lot of crates and you're there to kind of inspect the work. And from, the, um, from working at the foundation and under Joanne was an incredible mentor and, and friend and really was helping me make decisions on what I wanted to kind of go into career-wise. And she strongly suggested that I look at graduate programs. And so I decided on entering the Courtauld Institute of Art. And this is a, a picture of, of the front. And this is in the summer where there's a beautiful fountains. And in the winter, there's an ice skating rink. Um, it's really beautiful. And on the right, right hand side is um, where the library is and classrooms. And then the left hand side is where um, the whole conservation wing is. So Mary was just telling me about having Scripps having a whole new conservation program. Um, so this would be an incredible program for anyone that's interested in, in conservation. And one of my first um, projects working in um, working at school was my my focus was on contemporary British art, and I couldn't figure out how to write about British art without referencing Charles Saatchi and Damien Hirst. Um, it was when I was in school, it was 2004 was when I started. And people have kind of a different sense of collectors in, in Europe, I found, in London. 
Charles Saatchi is um, very much known not as a collector, as much more as, of, as a dealer. And so I was really interested in his influence on the young British artists and kind of building up different people's careers. Um, I also had my professor in my, my course was, uh, had an economics background. And so he and I kind of got along really well um, because also from working at the Broad Foundation, I was really interested in um, kind of the, the auction side of things or buying and acquiring work. And so my first paper, this is an example of Damien Harris that you might know. Um, my first paper really focused on uh, the, the pharmacy sale of Damien Hurst that occurred in October 2004, which was really kind of a pivotal sale in a lot of ways where Damien Hurst was selling items from his restaurant and, um, you know, even martini glasses, literally selling everything, ashtrays, chairs. There were some major pieces of work, um, but it was really seen as revolutionary at the time because it was kind of going against um, his gallery or kind of the way the art world functioned in a way. And so, and it was his most successful sale to date. Everything sold. He got the highest prices for all of the work. Um, so I was really kind of interested in how Charles Saatchi was really the driving force and was making, really made Damien Hirst's career. And right after I finished that paper, uh, it was kind of interesting for me, Joanne Heiler had, was coming to London to look at Damien Hirst's studio and invited me along. And at that time, he was making work for his next exhibition. And so this is a, a painting that they had acquired from that show that we saw in his studio. So that was kind of a, I was, I was very much immersed in the world of Damien Hirst during that year in London. And this is another example of another project I worked on. Um, uh, I, I had the opportunity to, to be hired from the foundation for a couple of different things since, my, since I was in London. Um, and they hired me, they were looking at a, uh, one of the medicine cabinets. And so they had asked me to do a condition report uh, at White Cube of one of the medicine cabinets before it went to the US. And so these are some of my kind of installation shots. I went to White Cube and uh, it was a little intimidating as well. I didn't really have any instructions just to document all of the work. And so I tried to take pictures and write notes. And um, it was actually a little dangerous as well because eventually uh, that piece wasn't, couldn't be acquired because of the, some of the things, liquids in the containers weren't allowed to clear customs. So uh, it was a little nerve wracking. But this is one of the, this is my, my notes from the, the piece. So I just took as many notes as possible to, and, and gave them to the, the people involved. So my next kind of point of reference that I'll be talking about is um, what has led me into my main research in, in graduate school. And this is a kind of a good point to start on was I was having worked at the Broad Art Foundation, I had learned a lot about different artists that were in, in the collection from the 1980s. And um, I, when I was in school, I was going to a lot of museum shows and noticing that the artist Richard Prince was kind of becoming more and more prominent within exhibitions. And he wasn't someone that had been in the Broads collection except for one collaborative photograph that he'd done with Cindy Sherman. And so it was in the back of my mind thinking, well, why is he becoming more and more prominent? You know, what's, what's the cause behind um, his appearing kind of in, in a lot of these shows lately. And so I started doing research and, and doing research on kind of the most obvious way that I could think of um, was on the secondary market through auctions. And so this piece is a good starting point where this is a piece that sold initially at auction at Christie's in 2001 for about $160,000, which is still a lot of money. He wasn't a completely unknown artist, um, but it's an addition of three. And three years later, at Christie's, a different edition of the same piece sold for, I think it was about 750,000, and it had an estimate of already 350,000. And so that caught my eye for two, two things because it already had a huge estimate, it was already the double the price of just a couple years ago, and it sold for you know double that. And so something definitely was kind of going on there, and so that initially kind of sparked my, my interest. And this is a, a graph. You could kind of tell just the, the general trends of the auction. Definitely at that time, there were a lot of things that were um, going, prices were going up. But uh, 
you can see the, the price for Richard Prince was really going up. And so this is, I started kind of correlating just a lot of auction data um, from the beginning of when he appe first appeared at auction in 1990. And so my thesis was really looking at, you know, the, what was happening on a global scale in terms of new collectors entering the market. Um, I was pulling references from, you know, Wall Street Journal, The Economist, um, that were naming all of these hedge fund collectors. Um, you know, the, the heads of Christie's and, and Sotheby's were all saying that um, there's a new collector kind of enter, entering the market. And I focused in on Richard Prince because I was looking at, well, even if they're still, you know, flooding the market and, and raising demand for different people's work, why are they focusing on Richard Prince? And he was a, a really good test case because he was someone that, um, had a lot of kind of critical attention early on in his career. And so he was, a lot of the hedge fund managers had curators or kind of uh, advisors. And I was making the argument that they were looking at critical acclaim and his Prince's specific role in the development of postmodern photography as a way to, to credit their kind of speculation on the market. And so they started buying very early pieces that were kind of these iconic images from Prince's career, like the, the cowboy um, image. So all of these were, were the first pieces that really started getting the high auction points. And then, you know, as he became established and the demand grew and different people were um, buying the work, um, his later work then became a point of speculation. And so the, his series of nurse paintings, um, which were done, I think, around 2006, became a, a really high point. And so I started kind of correlating the, the value between different people that were already had done well at auction, Damien Hurst and Jeff Koons. Um, and I was really kind of arguing that Richard Prince was kind of the perfect person to kind of slide in because Damien Hurst and Jeff Koons had already had, you know, success on the auction house, um, you know, already had kind of a lot of museum exhibitions. And Jeff Koons was, or, Richard Prince was someone that hadn't had a lot of success so far, and so people could kind of buy it early and then sell it within years and, and really um, make a lot of money on it. But you can kind of see, too, that the, around 2003, prices for every work was going up, and so the hedge fund, the people were still actively buying all of, all of that kind of work, speculating on it. And you could correlate it again with two other artists that I was interested in looking at, Ed Ruscha and Martin Kippenberger. And the other side note that I was finding as well that they were also using a lot of um, museum catalogs or any time, you know, if they had a solo exhibition that was coming out, they were also speculating on that as a source of revenue and, and potential um, increase in demand for their work. So, when I uh, was graduating from school and having done a lot of research, um, I was really interested in, interested in working in the contemporary art world and in a fast-paced environment and working with contemporary artists. Um, I was kind of interested in the auction world, but didn't, definitely didn't want to go into working in an auction house necessarily. And for the past few years, I've been the director at Acme Gallery. And this is a picture of the outside at night. Um, again, I had kind of strange pictures of the place that I work. But um, we're located, um, the address is 6150, and it's in a little group of galleries right next to LACMA on Wilshire Boulevard. And we show um, a range of different artists, um, uh, kind of new contemporary artists, um, a lot of painting, sculpture, video. And to kind of tie this idea back into how these kind of hedge fund people strongly influence kind of my day-to-day -day work. Um, this is an example of an artist that we work with, Tomary Dodge. And you can see he makes, um, these are all really large scale paintings. And they've always been very popular. A lot of people have wanted them. Um, he's always been, you know, if we have an exhibition, we have a lot of people calling about his work. Um, occasionally have to put people on waiting lists for, for his work when something new comes out. And because of what happened in the market, um, we have to be extremely careful about who we sell to. Um, we've had instances in, instances in the past where um, we've sold a work to someone and 
you know, they, they've labeled or have turned it into selling it at auction about a year later. And so, you know, as the function of a gallery and our job is to really um, kind of protect an artist and you want to help their career and get them shown in a lot of different places, but you also, you have to be really careful about who you sell to. And I think one of the problems that the, the influence of these hedge fund collectors, they made it very obvious to people that, uh, that contemporary art was, you know, they re reduced it, the idea down to the idea of being a stock or commodity. And you could, the idea that you could flip something really quickly. Um, and it wasn't about the art or the artist's career, it was about making as much money as possible. And so we're still really kind of fighting away from, um, trying to kind of keep the work away from people like that. And uh, you still have, you know, Charles Saatchi is very much after Tomari's paintings. Um, as well as a couple of our other artists, he's still um, buying work. And these are just a couple of examples of Tomari's works. And this is a, a, an example of, um, we took a painting of Tomari's to the Freeze Art Fair in London. And the art fairs is kind of a subject that you could have a whole lecture on in and of themselves, I think. Um, but we take uh, work to fairs, and the point is to expose the artists to mostly kind of European collectors or people that aren't going to visit Los Angeles, um, timing it with a museum or a exhibition from an artist. Um, but they, you have to be very careful as well about uh, people that are buying or approaching you because you don't necessarily kind of know who they are. And this is another example of uh, another freeze art fair that we participated in. This is a artist, Kristen Baker, who's another artist that is really, really popular. Um, and perhaps more so than Tomer, you have to be really careful about who you sell her work to as well. And this is an artist, uh, Caitlin Lonigan, And we just started showing her at the gallery. And I wanted to kind of talk about her work a little bit, um, showing you that you know, there's artists that we've kind of, like Tomary or Kristen Baker, that we've already kind of um, slowly kind of built up their career and they already have New York galleries or have shows in London. Um, and Caitlin's someone that we just started working with, just graduated from UCLA uh, last spring. And we had a show of her work in the gallery uh, about three months ago. And she's someone that um, it was fun for me to be involved with because uh, I got to do a studio visit and we all kind of talked about at the gallery that we liked her work, wanted to show her. And her work was also very popular, kind of right off the bat. And she was also someone that we're kind of um, been kind of a little bit nervous about, where we have to very much be careful about who we're selling to, um, how many works are going to one person or a couple people. So we've got to, she's, you know, our interests are kind of to protect her work as, as well as to get it out there and exposed to museum curators and different types of people. So these are just examples of her paintings that we had in the last exhibition we had. And this is an artist that I really, really enjoy working with at the gallery, Jennifer Steinkamp. And if you We'll have a show of her work in February, so if you have the opportunity to visit the gallery, you should definitely um, see the work in person. These are made all in the computer, and they're projected on the walls. And so when we have an exhibition of her work, um, the scale, our height of the gallery walls are about 14 feet um, by about 20 feet. And uh, we'll have, you know, for our last show, this was a series called Orbit, and it's this bird's eye view of being in a tree, and it will cycle through the four seasons. And so we had four different pieces. Um, she makes variations, so they'll differ slightly in terms of color or the leaves that she makes. Um, so they're all unique. And so we had four projectors going at the same time, and they're incredibly beautiful. They're, you just kind of get immersed by the environment. And I wanted to kind of talk about her work and um, show you that it's, it's someone that I really enjoy working with. And it's fun for me because sometimes we deal with a lot of, you know, the economics involved behind art fairs or different collectors or um, 
different ways that pe strategies people use to collect art. And at the end of the day, we choose these careers because, you know, we're inspired by the artists that we show. And she's someone that I, you know, when we have an exhibition, I love coming in in the morning and uh, being alone with the piece and really enjoying it and, and experiencing it. So. I think I'll let it go through the, the seasons. This is just a, a small clip. Her work is, she's, she'll be having a major um, solo exhibition at the San Diego Museum coming up in January. And she's in a lot of museum collections. You can see her work currently at MOCA um, in the show of the Artist Museum that just opened there. And is currently she, one of these for sale, or are they signed in numbered copies, or how does that work? Sure, this piece uh, is an addition of three. So each variation um, has, has three, um, and then it sells out. Some, some of her pieces are completely unique. Um, and so she has smaller scale work um, as well that are individual flowers. Those are editions of six. And this would run, to have all four walls in your house covered? <laughs> <laughs> so does, what's the price tag on that piece? Uh, well, these are, each piece is $50,000. So. Oh, sure. It's uh, you're buying. It's an actual computer, like a little, little tiny computer hard drive, and the work she installs the work on the computer, and then you, have, depending on where you're installing it, she'll. If it's in Los Angeles, um, she's incredibly um, amazing. She'll go over to the house, take exact measurements. So if you're thinking about installing it, and there's like a, a curve with different architecture kind of coming out, she'll all in the computer. She'll. Um, do a, an exact scale around to where the, the artwork on the wall that would be shown and, uh, and projected. So you're, you're buying, you're basically kind of buying a computer is the, is the artwork. Do you know what blossom these are? Are they trees or flower bushes? Yeah, they're, they're trees. Each, each orbit is a different, um, she uses different flower or different trees. Um, I should have shown you some other stills of examples. Um, but if you go on our website, or Jennifer has a great website where you can download all the other projects that she's worked on. And you can set some are maple leaves. Um, there's different. And it's, she all, always does um, specific research. So she just did a, a project in West Hollywood. And uh, she researched different, um, different flowers that were, had to do with um, old movies. And so re referencing, like, if, if uh, an actress is wearing a rose on the, pe the lapel, she made a whole piece on um, different roses or different, different flowers that appeared in the film. Um, she also did a piece just at the um, new UCLA Medical Hospital uh, for the children's wing. And she did um, specific research in terms of medicinal flowers known for healing. And So any questions, or I'm happy to answer any, anything else. That's about it. Yes? So what's wrong with the hedge fund manager <laughs> so that the artists have a decent income? Well, it's, it's very dangerous, I feel. It's, um, it's, you're inflating the value so much that um, you're, uh, the, I guess um, to take it from the perspective of the gallery, say we have Tom Reed Dodge is a good example. Say he became someone that you were really, really speculating on, um, and his prices say were five thousand dollars. And suddenly, within a period of six months, paintings are now one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. And so, um, the artist isn't getting anything from that. They're getting um, 
you know, if you if you resell a work, it's you know you're obligated to get five percent. Um, but you're you're also completely limiting um, kind of the the amount of, of of people that can support that system. And so very quickly, you escalate to a point where there's very very few people in the world or collectors that can actually acquire work. Um, it kind of cuts out the museum a lot of time. Of um, uh, one of our main jobs is to get work in museum collections. And if you have work that is suddenly a huge amount of money, um, unless you have someone that's willing to buy it and donate it, it's, um, it's very problematic. Yes, yes. You suddenly have, um, if you have a huge spike in value, you suddenly have um, no one can support that system. And so you have a whole lot of artists um, that are kind of worth suddenly, you know, forty to fifty thousand dollars in that range, and no one's really buying or supporting their work because it jumped up in value so quickly. Yeah. Is that an ethical consideration in all galleries adhere to, or how, what is the, you know, what is the norm? That's a really good question. No, I would say um, d definitely get different galleries have different approaches to things. Um, if you kind of look at, and that's why one of the reasons I love working um, where I do is that um, both of the owners come from um, being painters, and so we have a very almost non-business attitude in a lot of ways. Um, and you have art or galleries. Um, there are a couple good ones in Los Angeles um, that definitely kind of play into that system. So they, they specifically sell to hedge fund managers or Charles Saatchi, knowing you know that. What they're what they're doing, and um, you know, when when the economy turned, um, when there were, you know, huge amount of hedge fund, you know, buyers, a lot of galleries were loving it because they were selling a lot of work, and then suddenly, you know, they're not existing anymore. So a lot of galleries really really suffered, um, and you know, didn't have a client base anymore. And Acme, having refused to kind of sell to these these people, uh, maintained. Maintain their client base and, and maintain, didn't try to escalate any types of values either. So, mm hmm. Hedge fund types are very competitive. I'm sure they don't like the fact that you're not willing to sell to them. Do they have ways of getting around that? Oh, yes. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the problem occurs is a lot of our artists have other galleries. And so, um, you know, a lot of gallery, or like Tomary Dodge has an artist or gallery in New York and London, and his London gallery is selling to Charles Saatchi, and we have nothing to do, that, nothing that we can do about it. Um, so they definitely have ways around it, or they'll be very sneaky and say it'll be a new client that we don't know their name, and they won't tell us who they are, or they'll kind of lie about who they are, or you ha work through an advisor who isn't upfront about who they say they are either. So, and then. Six months later, we find out, you know, that they've sold the work, or you know, it's a very quick process, um, so it doesn't last very long um, because the art world's pretty transparent in that way. Uh huh. Huh, yeah. Uh, well, it's not a hedge fund exactly, but I would I would definitely argue that he was kind of the, the beginning of this trend. Um, I mean, he was one of the first people that really um, 
you know, bought work early, would buy a huge amount of work and then sell it all at auction. You know, he built his own museum, um, would... Yeah, I mean, you can think of that, too. I mean, a lot of the, you know, even the hedge fund managers that I've been looking at, um, you can make the argument both ways as well. Um, I mean, some of them are, you know, on the boards of major museums and institutions, and so definitely museums are courting, um, you know, who they are as a being a collector of contemporary art. But um, I don't know. I, th I think you've got to be a little, little careful. I, I don't think, I don't know. I think wh whoever sought you might be... Yeah, I, I can definitely see that, yeah. I, I would just, I don't know, he's a, a pure businessman at heart, so I would think that he might be one of the first first people that treated art like, like a hedge fund, but might not specifically be that in that business, exactly. So. Yeah? Well, I'm intrigued by this last piece you've shown us. Mm -hmm. I would like to know, as, if I'm going to invest in a piece like this, mm -hmm. what is the difficulty with, with this sort of art? Uh -huh. We all remember, some of us in this room, Remember Word Star 2. It doesn't work anymore. So if you bought this, I just finished this riveting book on the, the story of the, the Van, Gogh, Van Gogh's uh, Dr. Uh, Gachet painting. Oh, uh -huh. it starts, goes to Nazi Germany, makes it all the way around finally. You know, we don't even know where it is today, but at least we followed it. Right. How can you follow this in 50 years? Um, because the, is that little computer going to work? Well, she um, she makes it so that she's she's constantly updating it. So she can, if you buy it, she promises that she you can always she'll update it for you. So say if someone buys it in five years, ten years, and it's completely out of date, she'll she makes it so that it is up to date. And the I mean, there's a fragility about this in terms of logistics of show actually enjoy, being able to enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, and she makes it pretty easy though. If you if she we call her the bulldozer, um, she's she's pretty much um, you know, will look at an installation, make plans, and uh, kind of tackles any problem. So, yeah, yeah. yes. Um, with video art and things like this, are there ever problems with piracy? Like that, I'd be worried if you all this money for it, and all of a sudden, you know, it would somehow get out to people who didn't pay for it. Oh, sure. I mean, she she makes it so that um, you can't do that. I mean, she the only way that you can have this work is, um, you know, if you buy it and she'll, she installs it on the computer. Um, so I, I suppose you you could, you know, make a disc or um, copy the work, but it, it'll have no value. So it's like, you know, if someone stole a painting, um, it's kind of the same concept. I mean, there's she, she there's an artist certificate. Um, it's it's just like kind of any other work. Um, so you if you tried to you couldn't do anything with it if, if someone Yeah. <laughs> yes. I was wondering through your research about, you know, buying and and demands. I was like, is there a psychological trend in terms of popularities and buying artwork? And who created the popularity? Is it the, the buyer or the gallery or the artist himself? That's a that's a big question. Um, in terms of creating popularity, I mean that's that's one of the things that's kind of interesting, and it's it's so intertwined. I mean, you have someone like, um, you know, Damien Hirst, and you know, or um, Murakami, um, someone that's, you know, you can, or Richard Prince, you know, you can, they're popular for, you know, you can you can look back and and find reasons why they're successful as artists, um, but it's also a lot of it is marketing and, and promotion. Um, and so depending on the gallery or the systems of, you know, a lot of the people that run galleries are, you know, have business degrees or, um, you know, are, are purely kind of market driven um, and know, you know, do various kind of specific things that will drive up, you know, increase the popularity or take them to every art fair and get them exposed on a huge level. Um, so there's different ways that you can, it, can approach it. Yeah. Any other questions or anything I can help with? Thank you All right, so thanks. Much.